Hello students, I am Prithvira Singh and I hereby I will be explaining you the analysis of the Hindu newspaper of 1st of February 2022. Now this is a significant day because on the last day of January that is 31st January the economic survey was published. A very very important document, a document published by the government especially the finance ministry and if you go in depth you will understand that economic survey is being produced by Department of Economic Affairs, a department working under finance ministry, right? So there are various departments under finance ministry like Department of Economic Affairs, Department of Revenue, Department of Expenditure, Department of Investment and Public Asset Management. So Department of Economic Affairs is concerned with the publication of economic survey and the union budget, right? So under the Department of Economic Affairs, there is a division called as Economic Affairs Division, which publishes the economic survey. I hope it is clear, right? It has been asked in the examination many a times that which department publishes the union budget and the economic survey. So both the union budget and the economic survey is being published by Department of Economic Affairs, Ministry of Finance, right? Now, uh, economic survey is a very important document because it gives you the statistics of the country it gives you the macroeconomic indicators what is the gdp what is the projected gdp for the next financial year right what is how we are doing you know in in terms of our advanced estimate uh, in terms of our advanced estimates right what is what are the uh, growth what is the growth rate what is gross per capita uh, you know per capita income so all the important uh, indicators like balance of pre uh, balance of trade current account deficit they all are being mentioned in uh, the economic survey a very important document which is being published on 31st january you know by the chief economic advisor right chief economic advisor who has been recently appointed right so you can see students on the screen uh, finance minister has did uh, you know has uh, given up so much details about the economic survey and it has been projected it has been you know published by the chief economic advisor of the government nageshwaran and mind you nageshwaran is being recently appointed in the uh, as the chief economic advisor for the government right so therefore it is a very important fact for the examination the chief economic advisor right is nageshwaran and he has been recently appointed as you know uh, the person who would be publishing the economic survey right now very important uh, forecast which the economic survey has made this time see when I, when you talk about economic survey you will be mentioning economic survey for the year 20 21 22 right so that is how you actually you know write or mention the economic survey so all the statistics of the year 2021 2022 because we all know that the new financial year you know, it starts with 1st of April and it ends at 31st March. 1st April till 31st March. Right. So, this is your financial year. Correct. So, the data of the 2021, the financial year starting in the last year, 1st April 2021 till 31st March 2022. Mind you, the financial year is yet to be complete, right? So, therefore, any estimate, so any projection would always be an estimate, right? But definitely, uh, in as far as the US uh, uh, mode of writing is concerned, we say financial year, so this is, would be called as financial year 23, right? So, it would start from... 1st April 2022 and it will go till 31st March 2023. So, this is a US convention that we follow students. The year, the financial year is being ending in, 20, on, in the year 2023. So, we would be writing it as financial year 23, right? And the budget would be produced for the financial year 23, which would cover the whole financial year of 2022 till 2023. Right. That is 1st April 2022 till 31st March 2023. And they would it would be mentioned by the year, the financial year ending, you know, uh, that is 2023. So it would always be regarded as financial year 23. Right. And the economic survey would be that of the last year, 21 till 22. Right. So I think uh, uh, we are clear with these concepts. Now, the economic survey has projected the GDP growth rate, you know, to be 8 to 8.5% in the year 
थ्री राइट सो इन द फाइनेंशियल ईयर ट्वेंटी थ्री द जी डी पी ग्रोथ रेट द जी डी पी एंड हियर दे आर वेरी क्लियर द जी डी पी ग्रोथ रेट दैट इज दल जी डी पी ग्रोथ रेट इज एट टू एट पॉइंट फाइव परसेंट स्टूडेंट्स एट टू एट पॉइंट फाइव परसेंट राइट एंड यू वुड बी नोइंग अबाउट द वॉट द डिफरेंस बिटवीन द रियल जी डी पी एंड द नॉमिनल जी डी पी राइट द रियल जी डी पी इज द वन विच यू which you which you take based on the the base year price and the base year price is 2012 right and nominal gdp is always calculated at the current year prices right or the current years prices that is the 2022 Uh, the financial year 2022 current year uh, prices would when you when, when you use those prices it would be called as the nominal gdp and we will consider the base year price that is a uh, base year is being is 2012 and that would be called as the real gdp so the real gdp growth rate has been projected for the financial year 23 as 8 to 8.5 percent number one right the second thing which the uh, the survey said that is the gdp for the financial year For the financial year 22, is project is expected to 9.2 percent, right? 9.2 percent. It is still a expected figure. Why, students? Because the financial year would be ending by 31st of March. So still, it is there are two months to go, right? So therefore, these are advanced estimates, right? So they are they are not real project. They are not the real data or actual data because still there are two months to go for the financial year to complete, right? So therefore, the economic survey is expecting that the GDP. a uh, growth rate would be 9.2% in this financial year that means the financial year 22 right which is ending on 31st march 2022 this year right and the next year the the new financial year which would start on 1st of april 2022 and would end by 31st march 2023 the gdp is being the real gdp is being projected to 8 to 8.5% uh, the growth rate right so that is a very important take away and uh, we'll learn these things in the next slide let us see so india's real gdp as we just mentioned understood that it is expected to grow by 9.2% in the year financial year 2022 and very important to 8 to 8.5% in the financial year 23 right very important data and it is very very important for the clat examination students so by heart this data they may ask you that what is the projected growth rate or the real gdp growth rate of uh, the year financial 23 as projected by the economic survey published in the year 2022 right so it is 8 to 8.5% right and 9.2% is for fy22 i hope uh, there is no more confusion now and it's aptly clear right though uh, the economic survey has hinted that there are inflationary pressures why because see the government across the world are actually going ahead with a stimulus package they are you know uh, in order to overcome the challenges thrown by pandemic thrown by covid 19 the governments across the world are spending heavily uh, you know into public expenditures into the health expenditures and th this has actually you know uh, has increased or has put the inflationary pressures across the world right so the all the countries most of the countries in the world are actually witnessing inflationary pressures and you know inflation is when too much of money is chasing too few goods that means the income levels are more right and the supply is constant are you getting so when the income levels are more because of the fiscal stimulus because of the you know the liquidity push or the liquidity injection that is being uh, made by the central bank right through the uh, advice of the government because of this the income general income levels of the people uh, or the economy you know rises the money supply increases right and when the supply is not matching the increase in the money supply it would put inflationary pressure right it would it would it would result into the rise in the prices rise in the general prices right and this general increase in the prices is called as inflation right i can explain you by an example let's say uh yesterday uh 1 rupees or uh, to be specific uh let's say 1 kg tomato was worth let's say 30 rupees today 
वन के जी ऑफ द सेम कमोडिटी इज लेट से रुपीज थर्टी फाइव सो देर हैज बीन इंक्रीज इन द प्राइज राइट नाउ इफ आई से इफ आई आस्क यू वॉट इज द इफेक्ट ऑन द Uh, on on the purchasing power right of the money right so if i i for calculate here uh, calculate here that in 1 rupees how many tomatoes a person could have bought so it would be 1 by 38 kg right and and today the, the person would be buying in 1 rupees 1 by 35 kg right worth tomatoes right so when i compare 1 by 30 To one by thirty-five, I am clear that one uh, by thirty-five is less than one by thirty-eight, right? So in this sense, the purchasing power of the money gets eroded, right? And this is called as inflation, right? So that means too much money chasing too few goods, right? And it is because of so many factors which I have just dis just discussed. So there has been hardening inflation, students, and uh, uh, even the energy prices are also you know rising. the crude oil prices across the world has seen a significant rise right and along with the tightening of the global liquidity uh, which has posed a challenge right so the governments across the world are tightening the global liquidity right so the newly uh, appointed chief economic advisor students which i have just uh, mentioned a while back v anand nageshwaran right v anand nageshwaran is the newly appointed uh, chief economic advisor and uh, the growth hinges on the assumption that the the covid induced pandemic would not you know would be stabilized and there would be lesser uh, debilitating effects of the pandemic the monsoon would be normal uh, the there would be a withdrawal of the global equity liquidity by major central banks right and they would, that would be broadly orderly and next the range of the crude oil you know the prices of the crude oil would be in the range of 70 to 75 dollars per barrel right so if that happens then uh, definitely we would be able to achieve the growth rate or the real gdp growth rate that is being projected by economic survey that is 8 to 8.5% right so it depends on this foreground right as far as the shape of the economy is concerned if i compare the last year's economic survey they said that there would be v shaped economic recovery right v shaped e e economic recovery that means it would you know fall and then it would again shoot up right it's a v shaped but this year no such shape has been mentioned there is no mention of this shape many say that it may see a w shaped recovery right because pandemic lockdown again uh, recovery then again a pandemic so it's it's an intermittent uh, you know something it's happening stop and uh, start right so that is why many economists are saying that it would be a w shaped uh, recovery right but the government's document has not mentioned the shape of the recovery so it also is a point to be noted upon here you can see that the recovery is most significant in exports you know followed by the government consumption and gross fixed capital formation right so it has given a positive sign because there there is a evidence of recovery and the government's consumption you know has increased government's consumption has increased and the gross fixed fixed capital formation has also increased so there has been lot of expenditure by the by the central government india's and very important uh, fact to note it here is that india's investment to gdp ratio investment to gdp ratio right how much a country is investing as a percentage of its gdp assume let say the gdp let say is 200 lakh crore right so 29.6% around 30% of uh, you know uh, 200 and lakh right that means 60 lakh crore is being used for investment right so whatever a gdp that a country is generating right so india is generating somewhere around 200 lakh 200 lakh crore gdp so out of 200 lakh crore around 30% of it is being invested you know is being used in investment various investment and you know you know that investment creates the cycle where you know uh, results into the money mul multiplier and it is very much uh, you know good for economy right so the india's investment to gdp ratio has hit on all time high 29.6% so the examiner might ask you on these lines and it has the highest level since 7 years very important it's a it's a positive signs that in last 7 years it is the highest 
uh, ratio right now the reason why the reason is the capital expenditures done by the government and the heavy infrastructure spending uh, you know uh, done by the government so these are the the reasons why the investment to gdp ratio has increased right now when the economic survey was being prepared the world was under the turmoil of a new wave in india we call it a third wave by the new variant called as omicron right so so it has been sweeping across the world all the european nations even the united states is actually undergoing uh, you know huge devastation because of the new wave if the inflation is jumping in most of the countries right and uh, so therefore the growth in 2023 is being said would be supported only when there is widespread vaccination coverage there would be gain on the supply side reforms and a robust economic export growth is seen right at the same time economic survey also talks about a mix of the energy resources so it says that there must be a less dependence on the you know the conventional sources of energy like the hydel power plant the coal coal energy etc instead the government must invest or shift from the conventional sources to you know uh, to to renewable sources of energy like solar energy wind energy right geothermal energy so on and so forth and mind you the government recently in the conference of parties you know has decided that the the renewable energy target is 500 gigawatt and this the government has determined that they would be achieving by the year 2030 right so the 500 gigawatt target was being set up at the newly at the recently had conference of parties at uh, at Glos uh, at glasgow scotland right now so there is a clear it says that the, the government must shift its base from conventional energy to the renewable energy right now moving ahead right so uh, although the macroeconomic indicators are more stable uh, the reason being uh, you know uh, the fiscal on the fiscal front also we are doing good uh, the financial sector health is all although good right and the government the reason is that the government has adopted a very unique response strategy and that is actually you know uh, providing the safety nets nets providing the safety nets Uh, to the vulnerable sections of the society correct so safety nets means social security benefits are being given to the vulnerable sections of the society right although because inflation is being increasing across the world so therefore and it has also there is rise in the crude oil prices so therefore we must be very cautious about the imported inflation right imported inflation right now a very significant uh, fact to be uh, noted upon the wholesale price inflation right the uh, the index that we use in india to calculate inflation right the wholesale price inflation right or wpi wholesale price index right now it has been you know about 10% or in 10 digits for the ninth consecutive month you know in december 2021 so it is a sign of worry although the cpi or consumer price index is in the controllable range but wpi is actually seeing a double digit uh, growth which is a sign of worry but uh, you know and even there is a strong recovery was seen in the imports right so when the imports are high right that means whenever you are importing something you pay in dollars right and when you are paying in dollars your foreign exchange reserves would dip right it would be lessened so therefore uh, india's net export has become negative right for the first half of the year right so there is a definitely there is a trade deficit when the exports are less than the imports right now although india has recorded a modest cad current account deficit of 0.2% right students i'll just brief you about uh, the balance of payment the balance of payment is a transaction which the indians are to make with the rest of the world right and it is being divided into current account and capital account now current account is like trade in goods and services for example you are exporting and importing commodities right capital account is a more uh, you know uh, a vital aspect for example fdi is coming in india fii fii is coming in india they all form 
you know uh, capital account some uh, foreign assistance right so there is a current account deficit right that means on the current account side of the balance of payment it's seeing a negative growth right so there is a current it is there is not a current account surplus but cad current account deficit of 0.2 percent which is manageable right there is on the as far as the on the capital account there is a positive sign right and here it's a negative by 0.2 percent right but if i talk about the overall balance of payment it is surplus it is surplus right so this thing uh, can be uh, should be kept in mind and the examiner might ask you on these lines the balance of payment is the in, is the is the account of the international transactions which the residents of the country make with the rest of the world right it is it is categorized into current account and the capital account capital account includes uh, fdis fiis and the uh, the foreign assistance or the foreign aids current account includes the trade in goods and services remittances right gifts etc uh, correct and although there is a current account deficit of 0.2% 0.2% but since capital account is seeing a positive growth so therefore the overall balance of payment is surplus or there is a positive uh, balance of payment right now moving ahead you can see uh, the data of the economic uh, survey the things that i have just mentioned are uh, here being uh, written right so inflation is an issue and india does not need to be wary of imported inflation especially from elevated global energy prices similarly as far as the tax collections are concerned there we have seen a buoyant uh, tax collection right tax collection have been buoyant that means there have been good uh, uh, you know <coughs> tax collections in both the direct taxes as well as the indirect taxes direct taxes like income tax uh corporate tax right indirect taxes like gst custom duty right so there have been a buoyancy in the tax collection so that is a good sign right so in this way uh, your revenue account your revenue side is increased right because in the capital also you have revenue side and the capital side right so the government is incurring huge revenues from the taxes or there is a proper collection of the taxes right even the gst collections have been increased right so that is a positive sign now as i said that the balance of payment there is a surplus in the balance of payments right so you can see here balance of payment surplus is there and this balance of payment surplus has resulted in huge accumulation of foreign exchange reserves so today students we have accumulation of uh, 634 billion dollars of forex reserves right so forex foreign exchange reserves right as a student just mentioned that when we are importing crude oil or whatever we are importing we pay in dollars right so we have to have a good a foreign exchange reserve we have to have good reserve of the foreign currencies right so when you're importing the oil you pay in dollars right and to pay in dollars you have to have the foreign currency with you right and that reserve is called as foreign exchange reserve right and that would increase only when you have trade surplus right when you trade surplus correct that means the exports are more than the imports i would say the exports are more than the imports right that means you when you're exporting or selling to the world you are getting uh, the money in dollars right so so the foreign exchange reserves are uh, seeing a very good sign that there, there is a huge accumulation of the foreign exchange reserves and they may ask you they may ask you that what is the present foreign exchange reserve or forex for india it is 634 billion dollars right why the reason is that the balance there is a balance of payment surplus right so i hope that you are able to connect uh, what i you know mentioned and explained in my earlier uh, slide now moving ahead a new news right so we are done with the economic survey the important details have been discussed the growth projection for the financial year 2023 is uh, 8 to 8.5% whereas 9.2% is that for the financial year 22 right so that is a very important fact that you need to understand some factual details also we have gone through right i hope it is clear now moving to the next uh, news in the hindu as you can see on the screen that the delhi court can delhi court strike down an exception created and and when it strikes down the exception would it create a new offense so the whole issue is about the marital rape right see students in india marital rape is not a crime sadly right in 
सेक्शन 375 इन सेक्शन 375 स्टूडेंट्स ऑफ आईपीसी सेक्शन 375 ऑफ आईपीसी इंडियन पिनल कोड क्लियरली सेज दैट अ हस्बैंड हु यू नो फोर्सफुली यू नो डज द सेक्शुअल असोल्ट विद his wife would not be considered as a crime that means husband would get an immunity you know husband would get an immunity against the marital rape now in india it is said that is, uh, the the marital rape is not is not being attracting any penalty right so the problem the issue is that are women you know are women because we are a patriarchal society right so women cannot be treated as commodity you know and marry does not make a rapist a non rapist are you getting so therefore if you are married doesn't get doesn't mean that you get a license to you know uh, misuse uh, your spouse are you getting so therefore a challenge is being uh, because there are two uh, you know ngos uh, by the name of rti uh, foundation and all india democratic women's foundation right now they have filed a petition in delhi high court challenging section 375 of ipc right they would seek to strike down the exception granted to husbands under the indian rape law right so the things that we have to keep in mind is section 375 which gives immunity to the husbands against the marital rape sadly in india uh, marital rape is not a crime but a petition is being filed in the court now the if the court you know gives some judgment you know possibly diluting section 375 would it also create a new offense so that is a question uh, in the article so if the delhi high court you know uh, gives his own judgment so diluting section 375 would it create a new offense right so this is something which is the mood of this uh, article let us understand as i just mentioned section 375 ipc granting immunity to the husband against the marital rape as unconstitutional would lead to creating a new offense right so if delhi high court create declare it as unconstitutional so would it create a new offense so that is a, a that is a issue which is there in this article right we'll wait and see we'll wait and watch what happens right moving to the next news now india russia discussion on united nations security council agenda students we all know that uh, russia is at longer hats with america because of ukrainian issue we know that america under the leadership of president joe biden you know is expanding towards eastern european nations and we also know that nato is moving close to russia right it has moved till uh, many countries uh, even poland its nato uh, is also in the poland right so so russia has posted you know troops in crimea on the crimean border uh, sorry on the ukraine border and they are threatening america that any expansion you know trying uh, uh, ukraine you know to include in the nato would be disastrous and they would be it would lead to high scale war right so lakhs of soldiers you know army officials are being posted across the ukrainian border and this issue has become uh, you know has actually is a has turned into a turmoil right so so we know that india today is a non permanent member at united nations security council and uh, and now uh, and russia is definitely a permanent member as you all know now russia is going to become the president of the unsc right and and russian embassy in india the ambassador and indian uh, foreign uh, officials are have you know under, conducted a meeting and they have discussed over the ukrainian issue let us understand a bit about united nations security council now students we know that unsc is one of the six principal organs of united nations we know that united nations is a international uh, you know government governmental structure i would say which consists of six principles or principal organs like united nations general assembly then you have united nations security council then you have economic and social council right you have international court of justice so on and so forth right so therefore unsc is a 
is a uh, is a six one of the six principal organs of united nations and is charged with the maintenance of international peace and security now we all know students that unsc has five permanent members and 10 non permanent members right so the membership is 5 plus 10 15 the non permanent members do not have the power of veto right now these five members which are called as the permanent members are the one which are very big economies right like russia china united states you know uk and france right whereas non permanent members keep on rotating every two year right so you can see that it is the only united nations security council is the only un body with the authority to issue binding resolutions to the member states right so it can issue binding resolutions that means whatever resolution it adopts would be binding on its member countries very very important otherwise no body of the united nations has can issue the binding resolutions right so whatever decision that unsc takes would have a binding effect that means it has to be followed without fail right now as i just mentioned that it has 15 members five are permanent russia uk france china united states and they have veto power that means they can affect the life of the bill you know it can end the bill by vetoing right even if one member vetoes the bill it would be the end of the the bill right there are 10 non-permanent members elected on a regional basis to serve two year term right and the body's presidency rotates monthly among its members right so so out of the 10 non-permanent members one of them would become the president of the united nations security council right and this membership would rotate monthly among its members right so every month it would be rotating right so if once you are the non-permanent member you have to serve there you would be serving there for two year term are you getting so each year the general assembly elects five non-permanent members out of a total of 10 for a two year term right now let us move to the issues with regard to united nations security council now the usual united nations rules don't apply to the unsc deliberations and, are, and no records are kept for its meeting right now the major problem in united nations security council is that the decisions are being taken by the elite countries right that means the five permanent members take the decisions and that is the reason why you know uh, the lesser the other countries like india which has a which is a definitely a stable democracy and uh, we are contributing you know heavily to the uh, peacekeeping forces right are being uh, their rights are being denied so therefore uh, in you can say that it, it it is not a representative body because there is elite countries which you know influence the overall decision of the united nations security council now uh, the absence in the united nations security council there is absence of very important countries like india germany brazil and japan right so india is not a permanent member as you know there are only five permanent members but because india has the second highest population we have the stable democracy right we are a multi-party democracy right our economy is also doing good our contribution in the united nation peacekeeping operations are also huge so therefore we must also be you know made the permanent members but still we are not being made we are in a bid to uh, you know be become a permanent members including india germany brazil and japan so these four countries india germany brazil and japan who want themselves to be declared as permanent members of united nations security council are called by the name of g4 right group of four g4 very very important fact for examination india germany brazil japan are called as g4 countries because they are you know uh, fight they are actually contesting to become a permanent member of united nations security council right so g4 and even south africa also claims so but it is not a part of g4 right now moving ahead the security council and india now the security council selects the un Sec secretary general very very important students the secretary general of united nations is being selected by united nations security council and plays a coterminous role with the un general assembly in electing judges to the international court of justice right 
वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट फैक्ट स्टूडेंट्स सो इट प्लेज अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट रोल इन इलेक्टिंग द जजेस ऑफ आई सी जी इंटरनेशनल कोर्ट ऑफ जस्टिस लोकेटेड इन द हेग नीदरलैंड राइट एंड इट ऑल्सो सेलेक्ट द यू एन सेक्रेटरी जनरल वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट राइट टू वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट फंक्शन टू बी नोटेड बाई ऑल द स्टूडेंट्स हेयर and if i talk about the india's membership india has served as a non permanent member as you would be knowing seven times right in the security council correct and uh, in january 2021 the last year india entered the security council for the eighth time so in all we have served the security council for eight times right and although india has been advocating for permanent seat as we have discussed now very important india took a very active uh, you know role Uh, active part in formulation of universal declaration of human rights udhr in 1947 48 so therefore india's claim to be made as a permanent member also you know uh, uh, it gets 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 stronger right india has also taken part in 43 peacekeeping uh, missions students so therefore india at the same time india is as per the date of 2017 india is the third largest troop contributor so therefore india must be made the permanent member of the security council right now moving to the next news on page 7 the hindu there was an article which talks about the employment state in india right and it it you know starts with the heading that there is a hazy picture on employment in india see students the data on employment is being provided by various agencies right and there has been i would say a uh, variations in the conclusions being drawn by various agencies right now majorly the employment patterns in india were comes from two major sources first is the census the census data and the second is nsso right national sample survey organization right now census data we know that census you know is being conducted every 10 year so the data that we have is of last census that is 2011 census so i would say that that is an outdated figure right as far as nsso is concerned nsso you know works under the ministry of uh, program and implementation ministry of statistics and program implementation i would mention here very very important nsso students works under ministry of statistics and program implementation correct and they have a uh, a department called as central statistics organization central statistics organization which publishes the data which you know publish which go ahead with the survey called as national sample survey of uh, which which has office called as national sample survey office and they conduct all the surveys i repeat students nsso is a very important data being published by ministry of statistics and program implementation there is a division under mospi called as central statistics office or organization and under this they have an agency called as nsso national sample survey office it conducts various surveys with regard to employment and other details right so we have uh, two datas which i just mentioned now the the sad part of uh, to nsso is that the data on employment and unemployment is available only up to 2011 and 12 and it works on based on the the census right so therefore uh, and we know that it is an outdated figure right so therefore this has been replaced by nsso data has been replaced by periodic labor force survey plfs which started in the year 2017 and it comes on annual basis very very important fact students all right so we are not using the nsso data since it is the last time it was published <coughs> was in the year 2011 12 right and it is available up to 2011 12 only because of the census right so that is the reason why it is outdated and we don't use it right instead of that we do use plfs data right which is being published on annual basis very important students it started in the year 2017 18 something which can be asked by the examiners right so in this sense we have the data available for three consecutive years that means 2017 18 18 19 and 19 20 right right so a second important fact that you have to keep in mind it we have the data for plfs for three consecutive years right now let us discuss about the findings about uh, the plfs the plfs data show that the unemployment rate you know 
based on principal status plus subsidiary status has declined from 6.1 percent to 4.8 percent in 2019-20 right so the data shows that the unemployment rate has been declined correct from 6.1 to 4.8 percent right and this shows that the number of jobs increased at a faster rate right isn't it when the unemployment rate is increasing that itself means that the number of jobs are you know more jobs are being created right at a faster pace right then the increase in the number of job seekers are you getting so that means more number of jobs are being created as compared to the number of job seekers but despite this students the number of unemployed persons has increased by 2.3 million between the same uh, time frame mainly because of an increase in the number of job seekers right now although the number of jobs created have increased but then it has not you know matched the i would say the job seekers the number of job seekers is, are still high and uh, uh, you know although the uh, number of and even the number of unemployed persons have also increased by 2.3 million right so it is just talking about the rate right now rate is different from uh, you know the quantified number are you getting so the plfs data has clearly shown that the unemployment rate has declined a point to remember right at the same time the unemployment the number of persons unemployed have increased right so rate is different from the actual figure are you getting uh, actual figure means in terms of quanta are you getting and uh, there has also been an increase in the number of job seekers moving ahead the worker to population ratio student the number of workers you know uh, to the ratio to the proportion of the total population has increased right from 34.7 percent to 38.2 percent so that is also very important fact to uh, uh, keep in mind the wpr has increased right now this increase in wpr is even more significant as it has occurred in the midst of an increase in the labor force participation rate very important data lfpr lfpr is the ratio of the number of people looking for job as a proportion of the total working population are you getting number of people who are looking for job as a proportion of the total working population you know is called as the labor force participation rate so it has also seen an increase along with the increase in the worker population ratio right the female wpr has also increased from 17.5 to 24 percent so that is also a good sign now this was an article uh, you know uh, uh, in an, the editorial uh, of the hindu so therefore the fact now very important student the sectoral composition of the workforce still shows that 45 percent of the workers are working in the agriculture sector right so still we have the if i talk about the workforce the highest workforce or manpower is employed in agriculture followed by industry industry to be specific manufacturing the secondary sector and then services but if i talk about the contribution in the gdp agriculture's contribution is least followed by the secondary sector manufacturing and then it is it is the highest in services right so this is a, a, a something uh, which is a very uh, bad uh, data of a sad figure the number of people employed in agriculture are highest right but the contribution of agriculture in the gdp is dismal is very very low right and this this um, imbalance is actually you know the reason for our uh, economy not growing or not doing well right because they are doing no nothing there they are not contributing to the overall economy and something which is called as disguised unemployment more people you know being employed in the agriculture fields than required right now the challenge is because of uh, there is a rise in the adoption of the modern technologies like artificial intelligence and the internet of things iot uh, and even the industries and the services sector have adopted the capital uh, intensive uh, 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 you know uh, uh, machines 
and there is a rise in the share of industry and services in the national income without a sizable increase in the employment share right moving ahead the news about loka yukt right very very important news recently students kerala government has the governor has passed an ordinance we know students that ordinance is something when the legislature is not in session either of the house or both of the houses are not in session then the governor or the president you know under article 1 2 passes an ordinance and it also has the force of law but the time period is of 6 months right are you getting so there has been a issue in kerala government the governor of kerala has passed an ordinance and it seeks to dilute the provision of the lokayukta act we know that as you have lokpal the anti corruption ombudsman at the center similarly you also have the anti corruption body you know at the state called as lokayukta correct so so this article talks about the same before that i'll just give you a brief introduction that the kerala government has proposed to amend the kerala lokayukta act with an ordinance right and uh, this has drawn criticism that how you know you can challenge a a a a act right now it seeks to dissolve you know the the power of the control of the lokayukta over the government right and the government may deny the findings of the lokayukta under this ordinance right now the central loka lokpal and lokayukta act was passed in the year 2013 and you know and uh, and as far as composition is concerned the the lokpal is being headed by the chairperson who is or has been a chief justice of india or is or has been a judge of the supreme court right or an eminent person who fulfills eligibility criteria as specified correct so it's very important that the lokpal is being headed by a chairperson and this chairperson must be a judge serving judge or ex judge of chief justice of india or serving or ex judge of the uh, su- uh, the supreme court right we all know that the chairperson of the lo- of the lokpal is pinaki chandra ghosh the present lokpal of our country as far as its other members are concerned it should not exceed 8 it should not exceed 8 the maximum uh, uh, membership is 8 50% of them should be judicial members right and remaining 50% should be one who have you know good experience in the field of social works etc and they must belong to sc st obc and minorities and women right now lokpal at the center and lokayukta at the state deal with the complaints against public servants right and uh, and uh, i recently mentioned that the present lokpal is pinaki chandra ghosh right i hope it is clear very very important facts being mentioned about the composition it should not exceed eight members half of them should be judicial members and the remaining half should be sc st obcs the lokpal visit which is at the center right is being headed by a chairperson and uh, the former supreme court judge is there pinaki chandra ghosh is the present lokpal right if i talk about the lok uh, lokayukta lokayukta are the state equivalents of the central of lokpal right original state central legislation said that every state is bound to have a lokayukta but the law has been saying that now it depends on the state government to decide you know uh, whether to have it lokayukta or not so that it is not binding right now in 2013 act was when 2013 act was passed lokayukta was already functioning in some of the states including madhya pradesh and karnataka right mind you uh, students karnataka today has the very strong lokayukta and in fact i would say that in our country karnataka has the one of the strongest lokayukta right and the first lokayukta in india was was set up in the state of maharashtra right <laughs> similarly students uh, the cabinet has recommended uh, the cabinet of kerala government has recommended that uh, you know the governor uh because in the ordinance they are saying that uh, uh uh they would be diluting the provisions of lokayukta and you know uh, it proposes to give the government powers to either accept or reject the verdict of the lokayukta now it would be of no use you know when the verdict of the lokayukta is being rejected 
is being denied by the government then there is no utility of such a transparent anti corruption body anti corruption ombudsman right so this is a very uh, i would say uh, something which is criticized by one and all and it would give an opportunity for the government you know to to be heard right so one month would be given for the government right now some facts about uh, lokpal and lokayukta virendra singh was appointed as the lokayukta of uttar pradesh on in the year 2015 by the supreme court are you getting in this sense students virendra singh is the first lokayukta of india to be appointed by the supreme court are you getting so if the question is being asked which among the following is the first lokayukta in india to be appointed by supreme court right so the so the the moot question is to be appointed by the supreme court so the first lokayukta in india to be appointed by supreme court is virendra singh right and supreme court exercises its power to appoint the lokayukta in the states under article 142 of the constitution very important details virendra singh the first lokayukta to be appointed by the supreme court and supreme court can do so under article 148 right i hope it is clear now lokayukta and lokpal they both are statutory bodies they are not mentioned in the constitution they are being passed by various uh, acts of the state legislators and you know similarly at the parliament now the institution of ombudsman was in inaugurated officially for the first time in sweden right so for the first time we had we had the world saw the anti corruption ombudsman or anti corruption institution in sweden it was followed by new zealand and norway you know in the year 1962 moving ahead the concept of constitutional ombudsman for the first time was proposed by the then law minister ashok kumar sen very important fact students if the question is being asked that who among the following proposed the uh, for the first time the constitutional ombudsman so the answer would be ashok kumar sen in 1960s right and it has been earlier also asked that who among the following has termed the or has coined the term lokpal and lokayukta so it was dr l m singhvi very very important fact students must is very important for the exams dr l m singhvi was the first person to coin the word lokpal and lokayukta in india in 1966 the first administrative reforms commission right recommended the setting up of two independent authorities we know about the administrative reforms commission at the central and the state level to look into the complaints against the public functionaries including the member of parliaments right now we all know the anti corruption uh, movement started by anna hazare who you know put pressure on the uh, upa government at the center and this in turn resulted uh, you know in passing of the lokpal and lokayukta bill 2013 which later become a, became a act right and further it came into force on from from you know uh, sorry from 16th january 2014 correct so we have today is uh, lokpal and lokayukta act of 2003 various attempts many attempts were being done uh, before also but they all failed because of the reasons which you all know because they all they talked that the even the minister should be under the purview of lokpal now the chairperson as we have discussed right and as far as the other members are concerned because 50% members should be from the judiciary and the remaining 50 should be you know those people who have some special knowledge and expertise of minimum 25 years so that is something which is very very student uh, important students the remaining 50 members should have 50% members should have the experience should have the expertise and the special knowledge of minimum 25 years in the matters relating to anti corruption policy public administration vigilance finance including insurance and banking right so this is a fact which is very very important and has to be kept in mind by in all by all the students i hope it is clear moving ahead right so out of the maximum eight members half of them are from the judiciary and and the remaining 50 are from sc st obc minorities women who have expertise and subject knowledge subject knowledge of 25 minimum 25 years right now uh, the term for the office of lokpal chairman and members is students 5 years till the age of 70 years right 
so once they are being appointed they would resume the office they would assume the office for 5 years or till they attain the age of 70 years whichever is earlier so very important fact and the all the members are appointed by the president right on the recommendation of a selection committee correct very important and this selection committee is composed of prime minister who is the chairperson the speaker of the lok sabha the leader of opposition in lok sabha the chief justice of india or a judge nominated by him and one eminent jurist right so we have the collegium to actually you know appoint or the selection committee to appoint the lokpal in india consist of prime minister as chairperson second speaker lok sabha third leader of opposition lok sabha fourth chief justice of india or a judge nominated by him or her right and one eminent jurist right so this is a composition of the committee which actually you know selects the loka lokpal now some more uh, facts the dopt department of personal and training is supposed to put together a list of the candidates interested to be the chairman of the members chairman or members of the lokpal but the selection panel was separately being formed under the uh, leadership of prime minister and uh, they may not pick names suggested by the search committee right so the government in september 2018 has constituted a search committee headed by former supreme court judge justice ranjan prakash desai right so they may ask you on these line that which committee was being formed by the government you know to propose the look who would be the lokpal right so it the they have come they formed a search committee and this committee was being headed by justice ranjan prakash desai right so this is an important fact to remember and uh the lokpal jurisdiction and powers if i talk uh, the lokpal as i said uh, under its jurisdiction mind you student even the prime minister would come under his jurisdiction ministers would also come the all the members of parliament would also come so very important fact students if i talk about the powers if i talk about the powers of the lokpal right under its jurisdiction you will be having the prime minister all the ministers even the members of the parliament all the group a b c and d officers and officials of the central government right so it has under its purview under its radar even the prime minister of the country right but the jurisdiction of the lokpal included the prime minister except on allegations of corruption you know so the jurisdiction of the lokpal would include the prime minister so this is uh, here is the catch right and the catch is that the if there is some there are some allegations of corruption on the prime minister relating to international relations security public order atomic energy and space because students these are some confidential matters these are some issues you know security issues sensitive issues for the countries so therefore if there is any allegation against the prime minister you know uh, again for the for for its involvement in the corruption uh, uh, when 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 the activity is being related to international relations security public order or atomic energy and space no investigation can be constituted against the prime minister right so although prime minister is coming under the jurisdiction of lokpal but when there are some allegations based on these confidential matters the lokpal do not have jurisdiction to go ahead with the inquiry right so very very important fact the lokpal does not have jurisdiction of over ministers and member of parliaments in the matter of anything said in the parliament or a vote given there right very very important fact students whatever that is being said on the floor of the house by any minister or by any member of parliament right or 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 you know the vote that they you know give in the parliament right no inquiry can be constituted by the lokpal right so this is also the immunity given to the ministers and the mps right other than that the ministers and the members of the parliament are comes under the jurisdiction of lokpal now lokpal has the powers to power to superintendence over and give direction to cbi so very important it has power also over cbi right it has power of superintendence and direction over the cbi correct and the first state student to set up lokayukta was maharashtra very important it has been asked many times in the examination it was maharashtra in the year 1972 which you know set up the first lokayukta in the country and karnataka ke is the state which has the most powerful lokayukta in india so students i hope you enjoyed the current affairs session of 1st february 2022 
and uh, we'll be continuing our series over the newspaper analysis. I am your educator Prithviraj Singh signing off. Good day. Goodbye.